it kind of takes, I think, a lot of pressure off of the actor when you realize that so much of getting a job is these gut connections and reactions and impulses that it's, it's not about being perfect. It's not about having every word, word perfect. It's not about being flawless. It's not being bulletproof where I don't need to give you direction because it's so perfect. Like we, we want you to be flawed and human and messy and find your way through things because that's what we, when we watch film and TV, we watch it because it's a reflection of being alive. And sometimes I, I often watch people's relationships in film and TV and I'm like, oh, that's what being in an intimate relationship is like, or that's what having a fight is like. And like, you wanna watch people be messy and real to learn what other people's experience of humanity is. So how could you come in and be perfect if that's what we're looking for? We're looking for human. Awesome. All right, Carly Famala, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me all the way from, from New York. How are you doing? I'm good. It's sunny today and I'm so excited to be here. This is really, really cool. Awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. It's like, you know, we were talking about it before hitting record. The internet's letting us sort of bring this whole world together of, of everybody, whether you're in New York or the UK or wherever in the world. Like, yeah. it's so much more accessible well, it always was, but now we're like really realizing how accessible it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even just the way that we met, we met through a class and there were people from everywhere in that class. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, wow, you, you really can pull people together from so many places right now because everyone has the time and is looking for community. So That's the great thing about that class, the, the Manuel Pira one in my point of view, because it, it, it gives access. First of all, he's like one of the nicest guys you're going to meet ever truly ever second of all it's like to your point anybody anywhere in the world can get access and like not every actor lives in a major market to do in-person workshops and this actually just cuts the barrier right out plus you get to do five different scenes over five days so you guys see more of our work in that way so it's it's, it's pretty great yeah i agree so i'm glad so, i brought it <laughs> absolutely absolutely so how's i mean obviously i guess it's super like almost dead if not totally dead for you or is your office still like how's your office i guess if you get into business mode how is your office yeah. dealing with um the current kind of lockdown situation is it it's the strangest feeling it's it is a real eye-opener to i think hopefully for actors to see truly how much we're all in the same boat like we are freelance we i don't get paid from my office i get paid from the studio in the middle of a job the way that like you would as an actor so it's really similar um and for us like if we can't shoot we can't really cast because there's it's hard to know who's available for what and what you're booking them for and we can't book unless there's dates and you know it just becomes this whole um chicken or the egg situation um so we were in the middle of shooting and casting a tv show Mm. and that had to get put on hiatus and now we're just kind of in limbo with that we're hearing rumors about how they plan to go back and when but everything's so up in the air that we're waiting on that and then other than that it's there's not really anything else to do or coming in it's the strangest feeling um is this so, the yeah. first time in your in your career that you've had this kind of downtime in this way because even if you take a vacation, there's still stuff happening without you there. But this is like- oh, it's been so weird. I've had so many ups and downs with this period. Again, I'm sure everyone has on both sides. Like yeah. some days I wake up and I'm like, I didn't realize how badly I needed a break. Like I feel like I've been running myself into the ground and suddenly I mm -hmm. sleep for 10 hours a night and I'm like, this is, I just needed to get like thrown into like a rehab facility for like feeling like myself again. <laughs> and now I feel like, really grateful for this time that I've gotten to like really rest and like really disconnect because um, I have had some, you know, of course everyone has ups and downs and unemployment um, is the, just the nature of our business. And it's really hard to relax when you have time off and it never goes for as long as you think it's going to go. And you spend that whole time panicking and then suddenly you get another job and you're like, wow, I could have done something with that month. So I finally, like after maybe four or five years of having those little weird breaks and then I'd have a panic attack and then I'd go back to work. I started reframing my breaks for myself where as soon as I knew I was going to be on hiatus, I would just look and see what I could book a flight for 
and I would just take a trip and I would like leave the country. <laughs> I would just go far away and be like, yeah, I'm probably going to spend a bit of money or I'm going to go stay with a friend or I'm going to do something that's going to take my mind off of this and make me feel like this is my vacation time. But it never fully, you can never fully disconnect because you're still like checking your email and you're like, did you hear anything about that thing that we might get? And um, so yeah, it's been both really good and really strange having like really no guilt about relaxing. It's sure. really strange. Do you think that when you uh, when we eventually, whenever the hell that is, kick back into some kind of gear, because we don't know what that's going to look like, do you think this will reframe your working style in the future? Like, is that now a shift in perpetuity for you? I I definitely think I'm going to come in so much more energized and refocused. I really think like the world needed to breathe for a second, and I hope we all come together with more empathy and compassion and just a little bit more like relaxation about our lives and the space that we need. Um, and I think it's going to lead to some really nice results is again, me just being hopeful and optimistic, but I feel that in me that I've reached that point where I'm like, okay, I'm antsy to get back to work, but I don't want to resume like the hellscape that we are all putting ourselves through. Like there must be a kinder way of doing this. Um, but now I've lost my train of thought. Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, it is kind of like, it sounds so cool. It, it's, it's corny. But... Yeah, it's corny kind of hallmark to say this, but um, it is like you have one life. We all do. And, yeah, and really... the perspective, yeah, really... you know, that this is bringing. Like, you know, and a lot of people of... get perspective from like really tragic events in their life that happened. Like I had that last year, I, like my dad passed away and perspective shifted. Absolutely. Like, like that. Absolutely. But, but it's usually like individualized like when that was happening the rest of the world was still buying their starbucks and doing their thing this yeah. is everyone en mass globally and that's global kind of grief that we're all trying to recover from yeah and i think it's gonna impact and change the way the industry runs like obviously with the interpersonal relationships but i think we're gonna have to figure out new ways of shooting things we're gonna figure mm -hmm. out how to have smaller crews how to how are we going to feel? When are we going to feel comfortable doing intimate scenes again? Like what's, it's going to be a whole new world to figure out. And I think the casting process too, like I'm not sure how long it's going to be until everyone feels comfortable from both sides, from actors going into offices every day, waiting in waiting rooms with other actors. And for us to be seeing anywhere from 10 to 60 people a day, which is usually the grand scope of it. Mm. Um, that's going to take a little while for everyone to feel comfortable with again. So the process inevitably has to adapt temporarily and then we're going to find other ways to get the human connection aspect that we get in the room. I think it's just going to be inevitable for a while. I agree. I think the main thing from my side and I've been thinking about the last few days is this thing of if we're not careful. My concern is that long-term thing of seeing other humans as like the enemy. Yeah. You know what I mean, There's, it's this invisible thing we can't see. So now we're looking at something tangible and we are thinking well maybe that person's got it or is that person got it Definitely. and that's a really weird slash potentially dangerous psychological space for us all to fall into and that would be yeah. my one concern like again like live once don't be reckless but also we can't be jake gyllenhaal and bubble boy for yeah, the rest you of our life you know afraid of everything and everyone yeah so who knows? Anyway, we could. It seems like we could just rant, rant on for ages about that. But before we yeah. do and go any further into the casting stuff, um, I I guess it'd be really nice to get a bit of your origin story. You know, like how did you get into casting? What was your start? And sort of what's led you to to where you are now, working with Rory? Yeah. Um. So I grew up a dancer. I kind of found musical theater through dance. Really fell in love with theater in high school and was like. I must be in this world. Like I, it just, there was never from as early as I could think an option for me. I grew up in LA. The industry is kind of everywhere at that, in LA. Um, but also I was, you know, I grew up by the beach. It's very like, not like the Hollywood kind of vibes of things, but theater was kind of like the, the, the great equalizer of my high school because everyone cared so much about film and TV and the arts. So everyone from 
like the nerds to like the cool football players like everyone did drama and i just thought it was this amazing thing that brought everyone together and i was like i will be in this forever my so, brain my brain is just picturing you as like an episode of glee it like, was like glee without the cattiness it was like if glee was just like oh hey that's cool you want to do be the lead of that play and then never do drama again you have never acted and you only do sports but yeah it was really like welcoming and cool in that sense um and then I went to NYU, so I moved from LA to New York, and I uh, studied drama at Tisch, and thought that I wanted to be in musical theater, which I realized almost immediately was not a good fit for me. Um, but I loved the world, and I loved the training, and I just continued with it to kind of figure out what the best spot for me was. I always felt like I was like a bit of a lost puppy, where I was like, Oh, that thing is interesting for me and I'll go check it out, but it's not quite the fit. And I kind of like scurried around looking for the thing that felt like home for me. Um, and then I left musical theater and went into the screen acting department at NYU, which really changed everything for me. I was like, oh, this is the space that feels more like home. It's there's something really it celebrates individuality in such a in a way that I've been looking for in school instead of fitting into kind of like the archetypes of musical theater boxes that no one could quite figure out where to place me. And so day one, they were like, look around and these people aren't your competition. They're people to learn from because everyone has their own point of view and is going to bring a different thing to the character and it's not right or wrong. And after three years of musical theater school being pit against each other as like every class was like a yeah. fake audition and they were like, one person's going to get the job. So dance better than everyone. Or like, it was just so cutthroat. So That's so interesting. To... One of my friends started in musical theater too. And um, when I talked to him about it, he says the same, he like he, he just expected to go in and be cut. He knew it was so cutthroat. He didn't even think he was going to have a chance. So it yeah. built up resilience when he got into auditioning for screen, but yeah it's that mindset from a young age that he was ingrained with of you have to prove something to like yeah and everyone's your competition to mm. get the job and yeah it, i think that mindset really works for some people like your friend that it trained him to be resilient and gave him some structure and for me it was kind of the opposite where i was like you've broken me down and you haven't built me back up like it yeah. kind of crushed my outlook on the business so going into film in the film tv school i was like I just felt so free to play and try things and be bold and no one was going to laugh at me or tell me I was bad. And they would just say like, Oh, I noticed you do that thing. What was the choice behind that? Or like, maybe we should pivot here or here. And it was always like a an open conversation. And I felt really comfortable exploring my work in that way. Um, and I loved it. But then I started realizing the job of being a screen actor wasn't the lifestyle that was right for me. So then I was like, yeah, okay, I've gotten myself into this sphere that I want to be in, but I don't think this is the exact avenue for me, um, which I literally cannot applaud actors enough. It is hard. It is grueling, and it's a lifestyle what are you that... talking about? It's so secure. <laughs> it's so secure. <laughs> I say this as also now freelance, where I'm like, I really didn't do that much of a different thing in the end, but it really takes, it takes a lot out of you, and I started realizing that the more that I um, put my, like, dependence on my livelihood onto that lifestyle and structure it was like taking away my passion for it so mm -hmm. it's you're really one or the other either like that fuels you and you figure it out and then you get the the reward from when it works and when it doesn't and I just stopped kind of getting the reward once I was like figuring that out but um yeah so I was at uh the film school and I met a casting director and I had never met a casting director in person in a one-on-one like -on -one sit down way before they'd been in rooms and they seemed really scary and like the Illuminati and I was terrified. And then suddenly there was a casting director who was like, what, how old I am now? Like she seemed really like kind of young and cool and approachable. And I was like, Whoa, I didn't know casting directors could be young and cool and approachable. Like what? And so we started talking and she was like, yeah, so what do you want to do when you graduate? And this was like week one of school. And I was like, well, I'm going to be honest, I don't know. And I just felt like something in me was like, I can be real with this person and not try to like sell myself or be professional. And I was like, honestly, like, I love acting. I love actors. I, but I don't think I can be an actor professionally. And she was like, okay, so like, what are you thinking? And I was like, well, I kind of like directing, but I don't want to be a director. I kind of like the idea of writing, but like, I couldn't be a writer. And 
I like producing, but like, I don't know how to be a producer. And like, I don't think that's it. And she was like, well, that's kind of what casting is, is you're a little bit of everything. You're the middleman between all the departments. You get to have your constructive going to an office type A kind of job that I was at that time really like craving, but also have this kind of creative, you get to be in the room and you get to act with the actors and then direct the actors and read things and write things. And like the way she framed it, it was the first time that I knew casting was a job and it sounded like the perfect fit for me. And I was like, how do I do that? <laughs> That's exactly it. Like, I just felt like in me, I was like, everything kind of clicked into place. And so she helped me get an internship and I would go to school on one day and then intern all day the next day at CBS um, for their primetime casting department. And CBS's internship program is amazing because their interns run camera, which in wow. the casting world, like That's being super in early. The room, yeah, being in the room is like a huge privilege. Um, every office is different, but I have friends that are associates that are barely in the room at that point. And, and I have friends that are assistants that have never been in rooms. And so I felt so lucky that as an intern, I was running camera every day and I was in the room every day. So I got to learn so much and I would watch how people were doing it in the thick of pilot season and then come to school the next day and watch how my classmates were working, how I was working and like start piecing together. Like, well, what's my critique of what's going on in this situation and how was it framed yesterday? And it just totally changed my year and it was amazing. And then, yeah, that's a lot of information, but I, uh, I stayed at CBS for a bit, went to ABC for a bit and then bounced around um, in independent casting and continued to look for my home. And then kind of found day, it. And I met, <laughs> yeah, I met, I met Rory cause I'd worked for truly all of her friends at that point. Yeah. And um, she was about to interview for the get down uh, this Baz Luhrmann Netflix series. And she through a mutual friend got a hold of me and was like, I think that this might be a good fit for you. Do you want to come interview? And I was like, Oh, yeah. Um, and at that point I'd been so freelancey that the idea of, I, I didn't really know that I could do something for longer than one job. Like I usually would pop in, be an assistant on a pilot and then go over to someone else's office, assist them for a chunk of time. Like it was a lot of me bouncing from job to job. Uh, but I, but I'd never worked on episodic, so I didn't really quite know what I was getting myself into, but I was like, Whoa, this is cool. Um, interviewed with her and she was like, there's all this, there's a music aspect and a dance aspect and a hip hop rap aspect. I was like, I love hip hop and rap. This is, I'm a, I'm a dancer. I love this. Like everything about this, sign me up. I will do anything. I will research. I will cold call. I will pound the pavement. And that's exactly what it turned out to be. And it was amazing. Um, and that was my first, it was very trial by fire. It was my first like real episodic job and that was like five and a half years ago and I just never left Rory. But it's <laughs> interesting because a, a lot of people that I'm talking to are saying the same thing like they kind of floated around a bit and then eventually mm -hmm. they found their home and yeah. it's different for everybody right but it's ultimately I guess who you vibe with and who it's it's who you vibe with it's who has the same creative sensibility as you and who speaks your language like I really started realizing maybe like six months then with Rory that I'd be in the room with her and she would go to direct an actor. And I would, I started training myself. I was like, okay, I'm going to start trying to guess what Rory is going to say to direct this person and see if my taste is in line with hers, if my thoughts are in line with hers. And almost like immediately, as soon as I started clocking, like being really cognizant of what's my interpretation of what the note should be and what's hers and how she giving that in an actionable, positive, constructive way. Pretty quickly, I was saying almost word for word what she was about to say. I was like, whoa, this is cool. Like, I get it. We speak the same creative language. And it it's also started... really cool for actors to hear that, because I think a lot of times we think of like the casting director as one individual person. We know there's a team. Yes. But sometimes even then the conception is, well, the assistant does this and the associate does that. And you forget yeah. about the idea of well, so, actually, so you're a creative hub and you all need to sing from the same kind of hymn sheet. And Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Said. yeah, it's so funny. Sometimes like you can tell when an actor comes in and it's just me in the room and they're like, oh, I'm like stuck with the like the lower person. And I'm like, 
you would be shocked how much everything comes through both of us. Like if Rory is in the room and I'm not in the room, I then watch every single tape and we go person by person, go through all of our notes and feedback, have a full discussion about it and make a decision. And it goes both ways. Like it's, it's never just like she's running session and I'm doing something else and we make independent choices like it's it takes so many cooks in the kitchen to have the perfect recipe so yeah I guess our egos always like to get in the way and think that <laughs> you know I I demand to only see the and it's like yeah but yes, I only go in for casting director yeah. exactly <laughs> and then it's like and you are who exactly yeah. it's funny because it goes both ways like I'm always shocked when people are disappointed to see me because I'm like that hey, must be a, so what a great feeling that must be that must yeah. be amazing like oh or, yeah yeah but on the flip side too I'm always shocked when people come in nervous like it doesn't occur to me anymore that someone could be nervous because I've gotten so used to being on the other side and sometimes someone will come in and I'm like are you kind of weird like what's going on I try to like loosen them up and and then suddenly it dawns on me oh they're just nervous because I and then I think back to like of course I rewind and I'm an actor again and I'm like oh my god I'd be panicking I get I would get so nervous before auditions and that was always a big problem for me and it yeah it's crazy like when you stop and and think sometimes it's also like with that I I think for me with the auditions it's you it's you have to just do a lot of them like you know I think we're all nervous and I don't think the nerves go away necessarily but you know my first five ten twenty it's either nerves or false confidence because you don't know what you don't know. Like I remember going in my very first audition for a commercial and thinking, I got this. I got this. Oh yeah, 25,000. That's it. My mind in the pocket spending it already. Worst fucking audition of my life. I didn't do anything. Like all the bad advice you ever had from bad coaches from years ago, that's yeah. what comes out as opposed to your good training. And mm -hmm. Then you start to just have the whole thing of I didn't book it or I do a great audition. I haven't booked that. Like what's happening? You try yeah. to figure it out logically. And then eventually one day you've done enough that you go, there is no logic. I, I just like give up on trying to figure it out. Forget it. Just have fun. I couldn't agree more. It's like the ultimate catch 22 of the business is the best way to settle in and do great work is repetition and it's getting into rooms and it's, and of course, that's so much easier said than done because that's the great problem is how do I get in all these rooms and how do I have multiple auditions a day? And it's like, I wish I could crack that nut for every person. And it's something that you figure out on your own, which is why classes exist and are a weird necessary evil. It's like why you have community and friendships and the business because you get to practice together and have these like, you know, times to get that outlet out together. But it's true. There's just something about going in a room and dealing with the nerves and the people the casting looking at you and being over on your side of things and like it just starts to click into place and become less of a big deal with repetition exactly cool all right normally what i do is super structured but i am seeing that uh my buddy Cal, I could talk forever yeah. we could talk forever and this is crazy all right so. well let's see how long your let's see how long your wi-fi holds up well i'm seeing my, my buddy cal is in the waiting room he's probably super oh, cool. early so instead of me going through like questions let's bring him in get him to have a a chat and then i'll circle back and we'll just kind of see when we get Love tired it. of talking um i will never so, i have nothing else to do right now cal might say this he might not but cal's a british actor but he's got a green card he lives in new york so i'm gonna drop oh. that in there. i'm just gonna cool. drop that in there um i love that in case he doesn't and i don't think he's met your office yet as far as i'm aware very cool and i hope that he's like is ready. he in new york right now he's i think so that's what he told me he is. What's happening, oh. Cal? Are you also in my city? Hi, Carly. Nice to meet you. You too. How are things in your part of New York? Um, yeah, I mean, New York's still still pretty badly hit, but you know, I I, I can't complain. I'm I'm doing okay. Um, yeah. You know, uh, things seem to be calming down a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, I'm you're in oh, you're in New York as well, aren't you? I assume. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I'm in New York. Yeah. I thought you were in LA for some reason, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm in New York. I feel I am. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. But getting um, back. Do you have a question? Uh sure, yeah. Um, so I mean I, I I imagine you've probably had this question a lot. I mean, do you are you gonna stick to self tapes from now on for the first round of auditions at least, or do you eventually see yourself going back to the way things were? I think it's gonna be very 
day by day, step by step. It's so hard to predict what's going to happen like today, literally tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Generally with things, but I think, yeah, the plan for now is self tapes until it seems safe enough on both sides, depending on comfort level for the actor. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause you know, actors have to go from office to office, waiting rooms filled with people coming in to meet us. And you know, there's a lot of factors on both sides to consider people's comfort level and safety. So I think until it's guaranteed that everyone will feel safe, it's likely going to stick to self tapes as long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't imagine a world in which self tapes replace being in the room forever, right. especially when all, I can't imagine that all of this blows over and seeing people is safe again. And we're like, yeah, this is working for us. Well, like we are so starved for human contact and interaction yeah, and, and what comes with meeting someone in a room and getting that full imprint of someone. So hopefully not forever, but a really great opportunity to learn how to slay some self tapes. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you, um, do you look at the content people post on social media or do you prefer actual reels? I'm not a huge social media person when it comes to that stuff. Um, everyone's going to have their own opinion on it. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer looking at a reel, even if I'm looking at like um, a recent self tape or I, I just like seeing something, if I can click something really fast to see just like how do you move and breathe in space and um, what do you look like on camera? Because sometimes yeah. half of what I look at a reel for is just confirming or denying if I mm -hmm. think someone looks like their photo or feels like what I kind of expect them to come in the room looking and feeling like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's usually what I would prefer. Is it, is it real? An up-to-date reel. Okay, good to know. What about uh, things you know, though, Carly, like people who've got say YouTube shows or Instagram shows, like actual series as opposed to- Oh, just... oh, not, oh, oh, do you mean like putting that on a reel? Yeah, oh, no, okay. you no, meant, like no. you look at someone's Instagram. Not, or not, not, not like, like Cal's somebody. Instagram of what he's eating today. <laughs> Like, um, no, I think that's amazing. I mean, if you are creating your own work and putting it on any platform, it's kind of irrelevant, but mm -hmm. um, it's still work that you're creating. And if you feel like it's good quality and showcases you and what you do, definitely put it in your reel. Yeah, because I think the most important thing is, do you want eyes on it? And does it help someone understand who you are and what you do? And if that qualifies and it's good quality, I think it absolutely can go on your reel. Okay. Uh, and and a, one, a question, again, you probably get all the time is, what's the best way to get your attention as a casting director? So say, say if I'm an actor who's new to New York, what's, yeah. what's the best way to, to meet you? Oh, that is the question of questions. Like, I mean, because, you know, I, in, uh, years ago, I used to do headshot and resume mail outs. Yeah. Um, I think emails is probably the best way to go in that sense of just saying, like, I'm an actor new to New York here's my information. I have a green card or don't have a green card, just giving the basics like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and attaching your headshot resume reel. And if you have reps, letting us know where you're going to be repped. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just keeping people in the loop about that. Of if you do get signed, maybe doing an email blast and saying, this is not who I'm working with. Um, yeah, I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best way would be email. We just don't really check mail. You don't, I, you don't check physical mail that much anymore. We kind of skim through it, but it doesn't have the same impact as, like, I have a, a generals folder in my email. So if I get an email from an actor that looks interesting, I'll just put it in that. Oh, uh, okay. That's what you pull for. Um, it's a bit harder for me to keep track of all the paperwork that people mail in in different sizes, Ooh. honestly. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Yeah. You're not a fan of that. Save, save money on the postcard. Yeah. Sure. I think it's kind of has the same effect and everyone has you know their own preference on that but i think mm -hmm. save your money take a class and shoot an email versus spending all the money on postcards carly mm -hmm. with that email then would you prefer the actor to email you guys directly or if they have a rep would you rather the rep be the one to do the outreach if they're repped definitely through the rep if you're if you are repped i think that's great if you have your rep to shoot casting directors that you're interested in meeting an email and just saying like, would you keep this person on your periphery? They're new to New York and I think they're really special. And I think they would jive with the stuff your office casts is a great way for us to really take that seriously and notice when they're submitted. Um, yeah. I think that goes a long way having your rep do that. 
Because right. so often too, we'll be like, we're not really doing generals right now, but we'll keep an eye out for this person to meet them on an audition for X, Y, or Z. So mm-hmm. we do that a lot where we get a push for someone new and then meet them while auditioning them on a wall. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, from what are you from what you're hearing from networks that you're working with, is production coming back anytime soon? I don't think anyone has any clue right now. And I think it's going to be very production to production about what they're able to accommodate and what feels right for them. Um, But we, I haven't heard any specific dates floated concretely. No no one's preparing for anything right now. I I don't have a sense of dates, which is scary Mm. for all of us, but it's, this can't go on forever. Right. Thinking something's going to give eventually and we're going to, get back into it in some capacity. Also, yeah, right. Yeah, it's all speculation at this point. Exactly. Because things change every day that, you know, we could, we were floating June, we're floating July, and it's just so impossible to know or plan for that in actuality yet. So we're just waiting until the higher ups can ring a more firm sounding bell, I guess. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Those, those are all the questions I have for you. It's very, it was nice to have great questions. It was so nice to meet you, and I'm glad that I know you're in New York. That's awesome. Good. Yeah, hopefully I get to meet you one day in person. Yes, yeah. yes definitely. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And thanks, Ashley, for, for mm-hmm. hosting me. No worries, dude. Stay well. You yes. too, guys. Bye. Bye. I'm losing track of time completely, which is good. Yeah, well, like like I said, like I said to you in that email a few weeks ago, it feels like this should be a Christopher Nolan movie because, <laughs> you know, like Monday, Sunday, it's all the same thing. Um, I truly can tell you where the days have gone. Exactly. One one thing, so like with people who do their own work or maybe stage their own plays, for example, like you know Cal there, I'll plug him for him. Like he did a one person show off Broadway. Um, about like colonization and because he's Indian heritage, it was comedic. And do you guys like to be invited to those kinds of things? Do you have oh. time? I mean, the time, yes. I guess. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and yes. I love seeing theater. That's maybe been the hardest thing for me in this time. Like, I fill my days by seeing theater so often. Um, we have so much access in New York to great theater. Um, but also, yeah, we're constantly getting invited to off-Broadway shows, off-off-Broadway shows, all kinds of things in between comedy things. I try to see a lot of comedy. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so many opportunities to see live performance here. I love being invited. At least then I can be in the know of what's happening and what people are doing. And if I can't go, I'll keep tabs on how the show's going and feedback and stuff. And it just helps me collect the people that are making work and keep keep tabs on people um but also there's nothing that changes my opinion of someone i hate saying the word opinion because it's there's nothing that like fills out for me an actor more fully than seeing them on stage um because so often you know i meet all these theater actors in new york and they come in and they are confined to our small room and you know acting in our little camera box And then seeing them like really spread their wings and do their thing on stage, like totally changes the way that I see and understand them and what their capabilities are. So the more that I can see people on stage and just watch them like totally run free and do their thing just helps me think of other ways of using them that maybe I wouldn't know to. Sure. Would that be as well the same for like anybody who's made their own short film or series or or feature films like fire over a link or something if you guys have time? Absolutely. There's never any harm in sending them that stuff. Awesome. Even if we don't sit down and watch the whole thing in a dark room, we'll maybe we'll thumb through it. We'll we'll get a great sense of how you are moving and breathing and acting in the space. So yeah, always, always send that cool. stuff. Cool. All right. Like if you have it, let us see it. Yeah. Right. Let me bring in the next person. Because they're either here really early or I'm just again like not aware that half an hour passed super quick. <laughs> Hello, Maria. Hey. I hope your audio oh it is connecting. Slowly. Slowly connecting to the audio. It is. 
connecting. See, Carly, you're not the only one with Wi-Fi issues. It's, hey, it's a, mine's doing really well today, I must say. Maria, if your audio doesn't work, you're going to have to mine. Just write a card and hold it up. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk whilst you figure it out. Okay, great. Because otherwise, yeah, it'll connect. It will connect. It's, it's trying, so. Oh, hey. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. I can hear you. I, I mean, it was more entertaining in some ways. Yeah. I kind of wanted to see you mime the thing to Carly, but. I know. And there is someone just is deciding to cut a tree in front of my window. So I hope. Oh, no, we can't hear that. We can't hear that. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to shut up. I'll, I'll let you uh, have a chat with Carly and ask whatever questions you have for her. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Hi, Carly. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Um, now that you can hear from me. So my question is about pilot, because I wonder if there is any difference or any advice you can give to actors when we go for a casting for a pilot as opposite to a normal show, because you know, you don't have any reference, you cannot check the tone of the show. I'm not sure if you send the whole script or just the scenes, if you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the beauty of pilot casting is there's so much room for the actor to solve the problem of the character. I think to drive a whole series, it needs to rest on someone who has a really strong point of view and is going to do their own thing with it. So there's a lot of room for you as the actor to really fly and make it your own and totally show what your version of this character is and how you would keep that alive for up to seven years. Um, but I think in terms of preparation, the best thing you could do is, is research. I think when you go in for a pilot, you're probably not always going to get the full script. Sometimes you do, um, but you'll definitely know who, what's the network, who's producing it, who's directing it, who's writing it. Um, who's even who's casting it, all of these pieces of the team information can really come together to give you a great idea of what the tone and style of the show is going to be and some parameters of what you have to play in. So if you know if it's a Chuck Lorre show or if it's a Baz Luhrmann Netflix series, like those are very different kinds of pilots. So knowing what the constraints of the world are going into it is really helpful for you to know where do I start and how far and in which directions can I play? Mm -hmm. And then just figuring out what your lens of the character is. So like, what's, how does the character feel right for you? And how do you kind of exist in your most natural and real and full state while bringing that to the character and breathing life in between all the lines and making, I hate saying specific choices because I think that's overused and really broad. I think it's, it's more informed choices about your point of view coming through you through the lens of the character that then brings real life and authenticity to the pilot. And I think that's, that's what people are looking for when they're casting for a pilot is, is to solve the writing problems because they don't know what the show is they're, They have nothing. So yeah. you coming in and being like, this is me fully. And this is what I would do with your script. It's like, it's almost like being a writer and giving a take on an idea. It's, you get to come in and say like, well, if I'm going to collaborate with you for up to seven years, here's what I would do with it. And they could either love that or not love it. And you're presenting your, it's almost like coming in with a PowerPoint. Like you would, if you're pitching a, a marketing job, like you've done your research on the team of what their product is. And this is your version of how you would sell it. And that's kind of all you can do. That sounds great. Cause I always thought, I always heard the casting process for pilots is much more uh, speed, much more fast, because everybody is in a hurry, because maybe they are casting like seven pilots at the same time. So yeah. I thought maybe you only have one chance. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I didn't know if it was intelligent to come with a bold choice and do your own version, like you're saying, or just go with I think else, just, yeah. especially because of how expedient everything needs to move and because of the time constraints, coming in and doing your thing fully and being totally honest and committed to it is the best way to be time efficient <laughs> also. Um, Cause if you come in and you give us a fully realized version of what your interpretation of the role is, it makes our job much easier. And we can be like, cool, we can work with that. Let's present that option. Like if, 
the more that you can do the work for us, the easier and quicker we can move through our process. So <laughs> probably even more so for pilots. <laughs> that sounds yeah. amazing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Because I've seen a lot of times, like, some characters, sometimes they, they, they say they were meant to be only like for one episode and then the people like them a lot so they stay for longer. So I think, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can try to manufacture those those big bold choices but it's really going to work when it feels authentic and you really connect with it so finding that connection and that that real authentic way in is what's going to breathe that life into it that's going to make people want to see more amazing just thank you voices like it's not it needs to come from a real place yeah. to, to be to feel bold and real yeah amazing thank you yeah thank you awesome. uh, any more questions Maria? I have a question for the guy who's cut in the tree, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I no, don't know if we'll hear the answer. That was, that was my, my, you know, my doubt. I, I haven't done any pilot for a big network yet, but I always have that doubt, like, well, it would be better to come with something like a clear choice or not. And yeah. it's, amazing, it's amazing to hear that it's all so open and free. Yeah, very, I think it's very cast contingent. It's fun. It's a really fun opportunity because, yeah, people just come in with such different versions and interpretations of it. And, and then you start putting the puzzle together and you're like, oh, that's a show that, yeah, that really, like that person can hold their own and do their own thing. And sure, that's that's what this character could absolutely be. Let's let's explore that. So, And I guess then the, the work is also to match the people, no? You it's a giant like, puzzle. But all you can do is come in and, and own your version of it as whole as possible. Amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank Sorry. you, Maria. Thank you. Bye. 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 It is um speed dating. Huh? Like speed oh, dating. Speed dating. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody that it was speed dating at all though, so we should, if we pretend now that it is, that's gonna be <laughs> just to trip people out. Um yeah. it is one of those things with like pilot season where everybody thinks that you have to do a certain thing, I guess. And then again, what you've just said shows that there is no rhyme or reason. Yeah. Like in, in a pilot we just cast, actually, um, we thought, you know, we had a pretty clear version of, uh Oh, are you frozen? Oh no, you're not. Frozen. No, no. Um, we had a, we had a pretty clear version of what we thought this one character needed and was supposed to be. And we saw so many auditions and, this guy just came in and it was like not quite as it was written on the page, but it was just so compelling and so just so him and he fully inhabited it and made like was just in such control. It was like a control thing where he absolutely had us in the palm of his hand and we were like, that's someone you want to watch for up to seven years move through this world. And sure, it doesn't check like every single box that we wrote in the breakdown, but it's so unique and his version of it and you put that with then someone else who has their whole thing going on and that is magic and that's what you want to watch and so. that's him showing pretty much like a side of himself it's not making up a character and or not making bold choices for this that's the distinction that's choices. the distinction i wanted to make when you were talking to maria then so before i bring in uh wallace like the distinguishment between bold choice and being yourself or authentic because a lot of time we hear this guy. we hear this thing of just make a bold choice just make a choice just make a no, choice it makes you crazy it puts too much pressure on you and so i don't I think, think we know, know what that it. means i think sometimes we think that means i have to get these lines and now i have to read it but in like a, a, a i have to put some flavor on it and yes. it's like i'm so but, glad we're having this talk <laughs> no but like yeah. i I think that's a that's an easy head fuck for us to get into because then you think you have to throw on all these spices onto something and it's not your spice rack to be using in the first place. Like, yeah, you know, and what am what am I bringing? Yeah, I I totally agree, and I think there's something that puts it puts like too much pressure on the actor, and I think it's very fear inducing when you tell someone to do something like make a bold choice because that's not actionable direction, that's not constructive feedback. It's, yeah. it manifests when, you know, every, like music, every scene has a rhythm and a cadence to it. And it's so easy to look at lines and fall into the generic rhythm of them, the way that it's written. 
So how do you look at something and figure out like what that rhythm and cadence would mean specifically for you and how would you move through the world saying these things and like getting it really into your skin and making it the the boldness comes from it being fully original I think is really all it is so in the end like if we hear 10 people say this this line the same way and then you come in and you have interpreted it in a really in a way that really gets under your skin and it it's changed and it comes out in a different pattern pattern or rhythm like that sounds like a bold choice to us because you've done something different with it but it's coming from an authentic place yeah. i don't know if that helps clarify it, it, all, it does because it's basically i guess saying have a personal connection to the material and then let that flow out as opposed to saying yeah yeah play with it have fun explore get as into opposed, that imaginative space yeah yeah as opposed to thinking i guess like I have to make a choice so I'm more logical about that choice. So it may be like, right. oh, like this reads like it should be a romantic moment, but I'm going to play it as though they hate each other. But that's exactly. a lot. That's a logical choice, not, not yeah. a physical emotive one. Yeah, it's giving yourself a result-oriented direction instead of an actionable process, exploration-oriented direction that will probably lead in that result, but you can never direct to get a result. That's like, Casting 101 is you can never give someone direction telling them what you want the scene to end up looking like. Sure. Gotcha. Yeah. Love that. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's bring in Wallace and then we can kind of just riff once uh, we've had a chat with him and, and see where we go from there. Hey, okay, great. All right. Wallace is a, is a hybrid like me. He's from everywhere and nowhere. So. <laughs> I know. I want to know more about your background. <laughs> oh, God. We don't have that long. Head and about you. Hello, sir. Hello. Hi. Let me switch this light on. Hi. How yeah. are you? Hi. This is my self tape setup. What do you think? <laughs> wonderful beauty light. You look great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> who, who told nice. you about his beauty light? That's different to the self tape. <laughs> Ash. <laughs> yeah, this is where I shut up and let you have a chat with the guest. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. Um, oh my I have truly nothing else to do, so thank you. <laughs> Give me both. Um, so my question is kind of multi-tiered, but it's really all about self-taping. I was kind of hoping um, to, I guess, see behind the curtain of self-taping. So like, really kind of what I want to know is, do you watch every self-tape that you get? Yes. And so from beginning to end, <laughs> That's amazing and really surprising. Oh, yeah. We treat, maybe this is part one of your question. I'll answer this and then I'll circle back to part two. Sure. Um, I get every office is different, but we treat our self tapes like virtual sessions. So we make session sheets. We have our assistant make us a session sheet, like for everyone coming in the room in the day. And then as she gets self tapes sent to her throughout the day, she builds us a self tape log that's almost the exact same format as our in-person audition format right. on the page. And then I have, I print out both and then I go through all my notes from the people that I saw in person. And then I watch every single tape and I give the exact same notes and feedback on paper. And then who I, Rory, who I work with does the same. And then we go person by person from the virtual session and the in-person session. And we discuss who we want to send to the team and why. And we, in order to have those very full conversations, you have to watch everything. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's I'm, that's so heartening. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's you know it's the same opportunity as seeing someone in a room versus having a self tape from them if they can show up and do the job. So you have to take it seriously. And if you're watching a tape and you know halfway through that the person isn't right for the character, are you kind of doing this mental arithmetic of trying to figure out? Like, okay, clearly I like this person's work. They're just not right for this character. Is there somewhere else I'll fit in? Does that happen a lot? Constantly, yeah. Um, I, I really cannot stress enough to actors that we don't make judgments or uh, assumptions or assessments about you based solely on, like, one performance you give us. Like, if you come in and you have a bad day and it's not the best audition – We'll clock that and be like, huh, he seemed a little off today. What do you think? Maybe he was nervous. Maybe he was in the right headspace. Or like, okay, that's interesting. But like, we'll never be like, oh, he proved to us he's bad. 
because right. you have that day. Like, it's just never something, that, it's just not how the conversation goes. So, um, but yeah, constantly we'll, we'll get tapes that we're like, oh, that's, this person's just clearly not right for that. And okay, moving on, like we get it, but it doesn't mean that they aren't good. It just means like, oh, okay, our bad. We had them tape for this role and that's not a good fit, but could they go somewhere else? We do that constantly. Um, for most of our projects, we keep little subfolders of like elsewhere, um, good for the world or like, um, we oh, try to that's have great. One. yeah, we, you know, everyone has their own process with that, obviously, but sometimes we'll, as we go through person by person, I'll be like, I didn't think that this was the right role for them, but like, maybe they should try reading for X part. And Roy will be like, I thought that too. So we'll be like, Hey, can you put a self tape request out for this part? And we'll just see if that's a better fit. Um, or someone will come in the room and we'll kind of look at each other and be like, oh, we made a mistake. He was probably more of like a Louie than an army or you know, I'm fully making up names. Um, <laughs> let's, let's schedule him and have him come back. And so we do that all the time. Or someone will come in and maybe they're not quite ready for a bigger part, but we'll be like, oh, they've got such a good face and vibe for this world. Like we've got to find something a bit smaller for them as we get into episodic. Um, so we'll keep them in like a little subfolder of like, good for the world, try somewhere else down the line. Um, but yeah, everyone has their own process with that. But I think generally within the casting world, that's I mean, hopefully how, and I think how all of our brains work. And if somebody, like if, if somebody sent through a tape and there's 10 beats in the scene and nine out of the 10 beats are awesome. And there's just one beat that they really kind of missed or, or misjudged or interpreted completely yeah. differently than you would. How does that play out? Um, that's a good question. I think um, on one hand, if you have nine wins and one, the tenth is like a eh choice and doesn't quite do it, we're not going to hold it against you. You're taping in a vacuum and we're still going right. to treat your team like you've won them all if maybe you missed like a moment or two here and there. Um, but if, if if you've made like a really – and we'll send your tape and – everyone understands like the parameters of which self tapes work. And I don't think people are like, I've never had, I've never heard someone give feedback on tapes and be like, that person was great, but he made that one weird choice in that one moment. Like it's all step one auditioning and taping. And when the team's looking at the tape, it's generally to be like, okay, cool. I like this person. Let's explore that. Or like, these are my favorites from this batch. Let's maybe do a callback session. Like it's not so black and white, but if you've made like, a really big choice that we don't think is right for what is needed there or something. And it's going to then deter the team from seeing what we see. If it seems like it's going to take away when we then put it into the vacuum that someone might be like, Oh, I'm going to, I think that's distracting and I don't want to go with that person. We'll have you retape and just give you some notes and tweak some little baby things before we send it to the team. If we think it's going to deter them from seeing what we see. Because it's easy for us to be like, this person's great. And like, oh, they clearly just didn't understand this moment because we weren't in the room to explain what the context was. Um, but maybe our director is going to see that and be a little more impatient and not like trusting of what you then could do on set because they don't know you the way that we know you. Um, so in instances like that, we'll probably just be like, hey, rep, have this person call our office between this time. We'll give them some context and some notes, have them throw out another tape, and then we'll send that with the batch instead just to fix some things but um that also it does it depends on timeline it depends on what the role size is and how much we need someone to see the full perfect picture and how much of it is just getting impulses of who they're responding to right okay then my last thing yeah is, these are great. Uh, <laughs> um so this this is very specific to me i think but um so slating yeah <laughs> every every actor's nightmare I mean, I think I've done, I did a tape once where I took, it took me 26 tapes to get a slate, right? <laughs> it was just like, I was, I was like breaking, like, anyway. Um, I, I audition for a really wide range of things because I speak multiple languages Amazing. and, and, you know, I'm fairly ethically ambiguous and all that, which is, I'm so grateful, but there's this thing where like, if I'm taping for, like I speak Arabic, so I'll tape for an Arab terrorist. Sure. I, but my my natural persona is affable american guy right so yeah. and i feel like there's a disconnect when i tape as when i slate as myself but i also don't want to slate as abdullah <laughs> with a bomb in his bag it's a 
And I've never quite known what to do. I think just keeping your slate as neutral as possible will help. Um, I am not someone who's in the camp of the slate is your opportunity to show casting like who you are as if you're having a, a conversation. I go to a slate for logistics. I just want to see what you look like full body, how tall are you, and where are you from. So I think uh, I don't really use it as like a personality marker or like a benchmark of um, who they are in their natural state versus the audition. I just right. treat it more like, um, okay, I'm getting some basic facts about you. You're telling me very neutrally, and then we're going to go into the scene. So I think just keeping it really professional and straightforward is is good on all fronts. Um, I definitely don't think you need to drop and be like, hey, what's up, guys? Like, <laughs> that was a weird audition, right? But like, don't worry, I'm totally fine. Um, I think this guy, I literally, like, I, I totally get it. I have a folder on my desktop called Jason Outtakes. One of my best friends is an actor, and I have like 50 fake slates of him where he's just trying to slate. And I think it's so funny. Because he can't do it. He totally can't He cannot figure it out. Um, Eight page C, no problem. Yeah, and really, like, all, all I need him to do is just say, like, I'm Carly Fomalant and I'm five for five. Um, but it's, it feels hard and scary. So I get it. Um, so just keeping it as neutral and professional, I think. And you can be warm and grounded, you know, but trying not to use it as like a contrasting personality benchmark is totally right. Important. Yeah. Awesome. Those yeah. are all my questions. Thank you so much. That was super helpful. Yeah, this is great. All right. Awesome. Well, have a great day, guys. You too. Thanks, man. Bye. 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 See you later. That yeah. Ash, that just made me think too. It's I think that's exactly the, his self tape questions is why I'm I try to be so nitpicky in those classes like Manuel's class because you never have the opportunity to get the specific beat by beat training or feedback on self tapes that like we often just kind of skim over mm. because we give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But I feel like the the tools to building a really great self tape comes so much from context clues and things on the page that if you really just become a detective you have the same tools that we have and you can get through a tape without having those moments that we rub up against because we feel like you've missed something and gone in a different direction with it so that's mostly my whole philosophy for classes like that yeah and i mean you you were really good at that because you would come in and, and give people you know sort of top line initial feedback and then it would be and here's how you could like refine this moment to make it even better and it's yeah. not that like to wallace's point you know it's not that like nine out of the ten beats were, were garbage that you had nine yeah. great ones and one that was okay but if you just even tweaked it it would elevate the whole thing yeah exactly and like, like figuring that stuff out for yourself when you're taping in a vacuum and especially going into this next phase of what the business is going to look like for a little bit figuring out how to be that kind of detective and your own casting director is just going to make going back in the room feel that much more collaborative and that you have control of your artistry when you're so, able so to let, let, let's talk about that a little more because one of the things i did want to bring up was like on that webinar we had at the end with manuel where you couldn't see any of us um it's like no one's here for sure nobody is here <laughs> that'd be the biggest prank it's like if ashton kutcher prank casting directors that's probably how we do it um yes one of the things you said that the main thing that I remember from the whole thing was you said oh, oh self taping and auditioning in the room are two totally separate skills. You know, we know that auditioning and working on set is different, obviously, but then yes. you broke it down as like, well, here's this third separate skill set. Now I could agree more. Yeah. Well, I guess not. You said it. With I'm just, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just like parroting. I'm just parroting back what you already said. So I like that you agree with you. Well, you were saying it so convincingly. I was like, everything you're saying is correct. So that, sorry, that just must mean my acting training <laughs> has worked out after all these years of investment. So that's good you to know. You just got me. All right. Continue. Um, but what, what I guess, you know, to the point that we were talking about earlier of investing time in auditioning to just get used to that and being good, it's going to be the same with self-tapes, right? So could you maybe give your viewpoints on where those two skill sets are similar, where they are totally different, and then maybe more so with self-tapes because it's a bit newer to people, how you could then advise people to be the detective is what you were saying there. There's a lot in that. Yeah. But... yeah. Um, yes. So obviously everyone understands that when you come in for an audition, 
the things you do in an audition room mostly have nothing to do with how you're going to behave on set, except for the baseline, breaking down this character and exploring and having the conversation. But in terms of like physicality, emotional triggers, being able to use your environment, like you're starved of all of that stuff in an audition room and you don't have any prep time. Like we are having a chat and then we go, okay, and turn on all of your feelings and we hit start and then you have to dive in, which is not how it would go on set. You know, to some degree, you're going to be on everyone else's timeline and you're not going to have tons of time to prep emotionally maybe, but at least you have a little bit. Of, it's a different experience. Um, I think self tapes are much harder because you come in for an audition and you prepare and then it's a conversation. It's like, this is my baseline. Here's where I started. Tell me what I can do to hone in on some moments, tonal moments, or am I missing this aspect of this relationship? Um, and we end up getting to have a bit of a conversation about things in the room or maybe sometimes just doing it once in front of someone else and then getting feedback and feeling how it feels reading with someone else changes things for you and then you get to be in a better headspace when you dive into scene two or to take two because you you started laying the groundwork for the connection and then you get to do it again and then you find that connection and then you're like cool moving on um there's something about self-tapes and the endless possibilities I think of them that add a lot of pressure and you kind of I feel like you don't know when to stop you do one thousand takes you watch it back and you become so involved in your own process in a way that you you get to have that pressure taken off of you in the room that you go in and you put your trust in the casting director's hands and we collaborate and we try to get the best out of you because we are only as good as the people that we work with and get the performances out of and have the relationships with. So there's a real trust that comes with that. And I think you as the actor, when we say, great, we can move on, have to trust that we have your best interest in mind. And then when you're alone, no one is there for you to trust it, but you're knowing that they have the best interest in it for you and it's time to move on. So I think all that being said, the best thing that you can do for yourself with self tapes is learn how to be your own director and your mm -hmm. own casting director. And in with that, it's really learning how to break down material. I think using the page as your total guiding light as the thing, as your director, really, uh, is all of the context clues, is every single thing on the page from top to bottom, from page number to other page number, scene numbers, like it's all information and it's all context that we as casting take in and funnel into what we do with you in the room. So if you don't have that, how do you take all of this information and funnel it for yourself to give yourself those constraints, the ability to say, oh, I did nail that in take three and I can move on. So you're not making yourself crazy and doing 10 takes and watching it back and knowing if it felt inherent in you that you hit those specific moments that you understand the ebb and flow of the scene, that you understand your environment and how to play in that fully. And once you do all of that work for yourself, which is honestly probably going to take a bit more time and be more thorough, you're going to have even greater results because it's going to feel like you're fully in control of your artistry that you can be alone in a vacuum study and learn all of this and then just get to play in your imaginative space and build out this little movie for us and it's it really goes so far so and i, I guess would your advice be to just i guess practice that especially like you know now we all have all the time in the world where courses like obviously the one that, that you know we connected on are super valuable but even if you're not doing a course you fully know, know course. get to yeah, get together with like a bunch of actors you know go on and, yeah. and get sides yeah. and just like get get four or five of your actor friends together everyone contributes one scene and then you all do that for five days and send them around to each other yeah. and have an open discussion about them of and keep it really you know it's because it's not about are you good or are you bad it's about what well, what did you do to get to what that place what of course, of course <laughs> it's, it is. yeah it's having the conversation of okay well how did you build that environment for yourself and what was your process and like what were you envisioning that the space was like and then from that envisioning of the space like what did you do to set that up for yourself in the room and it's sharing tips and tricks about that within your community that's gonna then help refine it for you even further and it sounds so dumb 
but like it totally changed things for me is just read every single word that has been sent to you about the project out loud from top to bottom. It's boring and seems tedious and unnecessary, but it, it really helps me. Like I'll read the breakdown word for word out loud. I hear myself say it out loud. I look at all the names on the breakdown. I do all my research. I figure out like the tonal constraints of the world that we're existing in based on the context clues that I have from who's making this thing. And then I go into the scene itself and I'll start literally like, okay, we're on page two. Okay. So this is, a, that means we're just starting out this script. Like this is probably like baseline initial first meet of this character. We haven't gone in too deep. And then I'll read like interior daytime three o'clock. I'm like, okay, that's like, all of this is so it's the stuff that sits in your imaginative play space that then informs like how you feel. It's the same thing as like reading a book where you get to exist in that. Like, but I guess the act of saying it out loud actually forces you not to make a word. Well, yeah, it. and I guess it almost like it doesn't make it sort of any more real, but just when you're accentuating it verbally, it 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 kind of manifests it in a different way than just being kind of stuff in your head. Yeah, yeah, and it forces you not to skim through things because sure. even as an actor, I remember I would get scenes and like just kind of skim like okay stage directions, stage directions. Okay, here's what I'm saying. Here's what people are saying about me. Stage directions. Okay, I kind of get the gist of it. And then you get like the first impression of it and move on. And it was so hard for me to force myself to sit down and like nitpick every word and location clue and context clue. And like, it just takes that extra bit of like focus and calm attention that I found challenging. So it's the, yeah, self tapes are their own art because you do them alone. And it's its own skill and practicing it is all you can do. And it does get better and easier the more that you practice. And it's, yeah, it's like being a mime. I think that's also another thing I said, you kind of have to figure out how to be an yes, amazing mime. Yes, of, yes. Like there's so much you can do to clue us into where you are and who you're talking to based on like how you sit, where you sit, how you're leaning, what you're looking at. Like it's just existing like a human being and not feeling like you need to be in a box in a vacuum panicking alone in your living room. Like yeah. that, that, that is a question for the self tapes, which we did have on that. I think it probably was me who asked it. And it was around like, um, obviously when you're in your own space, you, you can give a hint to the costume. You're not going to maybe wear the full thing, but less than costume, more like props. Right. So obviously in the office with you guys beyond maybe a cell phone, we're not going to have props. Totally. There's a, I guess there's a middle ground in a self tape where maybe you can bring in a few more things, but also like, you know, don't build a whole operating theater for like, you know, ER. So what's your take on that? Like use them wisely. Don't use them and mime it. I think it's a great question. Um, I think every actor is different. Like I know some actors that come in the room and don't aren't prop people and will mime everything just below camera. I We have an actor that we love that comes in with like literally a bag every time. And he's like, give me two seconds. And he sets up like a water bottle here, a coffee cup here. And he just like puts stuff all around him and then he'll use it. But we don't necessarily see it on camera, but it just helps him continue the through line of what he's doing and thinking by having physical things to touch and move, even if they're not on camera. Um, and then sometimes he ends up losing all of them. Sometimes he keeps all of them. And I think that's like the perfect metaphor for like what you should do as an actor. Like if it helps you find the character or makes you feel more grounded and rooted in what you're doing, definitely use the props. I don't think it needs to be a fun show of like pulling things out of a hat, but yeah, if it's a comedy and you find a specific thing that like you have in your house that like you can incorporate that is fun and elevates the scene in a smart way go for it um as long as it's not distracting and doesn't take away from the performance i think use your own discretion and figure out that balance for yourself of what's appropriate and also what's going to help you because yeah i think so much of the storytelling can come through based on just moving you know below frame but if you're doing a scene where you're having a cup of coffee with someone and you're at home like have, have a, a mug you know it's i just think it's kind of common sense like but that, it's but. always like you were saying before you're, you're being informed by the clues in the script like it's if the so script bad. doesn't suggest that you're a pyromaniac don't all of a sudden bring in like a canister of gasoline and a lighter because 
that's got nothing to do with what the scene is. Um, yeah. I think that's more kind of the angle where it's like, if you're going to use props, make sure that they're referenced from somewhere, I guess, right? Yes. Plus, like, one of the scenes I use in class, which is one of my favorite scenes, is like a scene where um, a superstore clerk is scanning items. And it's such a good self-tape practice because some people will bring in physical props and, like, hold them up. And she'd be like, ooh, look at this prop. That's telling you the whole story. And when I watch a self-tape, I want to watch how you as the actor is responding to the situations around you. And, of course, on set, half of the joke is going to be pulling out the objects. But in a self-tape, the joke is your relationship with the scene partner, with the action, with the objects in the scene. So how do you communicate that in the tape? And you don't even need to see the objects sometimes. You can just, like, have a reaction and you know like I under I can understand from the way that you are interacting with something what's happening and for me that's what I'm most interested in is watching your emotional journey and how you interact with these stimulus around you I guess that's super powerful and I want to make sure that I get it right the way I've interpreted it because I think the message there is maybe really subtle and could get missed but I think it's a really important one that could be useful to a lot of people it's almost like you're saying, and if I'm wrong, correct me, yeah. that the performance on a self-tape is totally different in terms of audience, obviously, obviously, to the performance you're doing on a set. So as an actor, I think it could be very easy to perform as though your self-tape is like a performance for the end audience watching it at home on the couch. Yeah. Right? And I guess it's that thing of you know as the casting office what the story is because you've already read the sides and script. We don't need to show you all these things per se and do the set dressing because you know the world. Unlike on a Netflix show where we have to see that because the audience has no fucking idea what it is. But that's such a small distinguishment that makes a big difference. Yeah, we want to see you in control of your character and your space and not necessarily doing the work of everyone else in the scene. Gotcha. If that helps. No, that, yeah, yeah that, that one soundbite I think is, is it like, yeah, you guys need to see yeah. our work, not the art director's work and the prop guy's work. Yeah. We, and in a self tape, we want to exactly, we want to see your work and you can incorporate any of those elements as long as they help you and help ground you in the world and make it, your side of the scene um yeah yeah it would be like as if the editor were never cut from away from you in the in the whole scene and what would that be like if you were on set and all of these things were happening around you but all we could see is what you were doing like that's really all a self-tape is is if you were the one in control of the whole scene i guess gotcha. i don't know gotcha. I'm talking myself in circles but yeah I, absolutely take the pressure off of yourself of trying to solve everyone else's job this is your, this is the space that you have control over and be in control only of your role and your, what you're doing in the scene and don't try to explain around for everyone else if that helps. And I guess, yeah, the, the thing with self-tapes, I guess, is what you said, the practice, that you can do it more than an audition. Like, I can't just walk into an office and practice my audition technique. I have to get the audition book through. But the self-tape side, which is going to be more and more prevalent, like you said, we we can be practicing as much as we want or as little as we want and totally. and hone that muscle, right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I have a few questions here that have kind of been set in that we haven't really covered. So I think, you know, let's maybe jump into some of those. Oh, um, one of them is from, from Jonah LaRama and it's not that different to maybe where Wallace was kind of going. I think it was Wallace or it might've been Cal. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> See, time even on this is just disappearing for me. All the friends are blurring together. Yeah, right. He said, how important is it for you that people of color who are actors get opportunities? But the second part is, what advice can you give to those who want to book roles but don't want to play stereotypes? And I feel like the second part of that is maybe where we can get some more interesting conversation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, prioritizing diversity is everything right now everyone needs representation and to see themselves reflected in media. It's just important. We are finally realizing how important that is on such a grand scale. And especially with how globally our, our content is becoming, 
you know, when a show drops on Netflix, the whole world gets it. So being authentic to representing communities in that is so important. So I think we're constantly looking for ways to diversify our casts and it's a huge priority for us. And I think for everyone in the industry right now, and I think it's a great time to be an actor of color and to be authentically yourself because it means you have something huge to offer a role and can fill out that role and make it your own in a way that maybe we couldn't have written. And that's kind of what we were talking about earlier with series regular casting. Like that goes on the full spectrum. That's so exciting. If I can find someone with a really specific point of view to fill out something that maybe is a bit more generic on the page. So this is your moment, boy, go live. Um, and in terms of stereotypes, that's a great question. And I think it comes down to navigating that for yourself as an actor a little bit. I think you have to be your own advocate. I think in the end, you are in control of your artistry and of your business and of the opportunities that you pursue and feel comfortable with. And it's a conversation with your reps that you can have about these are the kinds of roles that I want to stay away from. Here's so many things that I've been thinking about that I could pursue or if this kind of role came up, what I could do with it and um, making your reps aware that that's not something you're comfortable with. So they can try to cut it off at the head before it comes to you even, or knowing that they can send it to you and you've already had this conversation and then you don't feel pressured to say, Oh, but my rep sent me this audition and I haven't really gotten audition in a few weeks and I can just make this concession and do this. Like be really clear with your reps up front, like what you're comfortable with and what you're looking to pursue and say that you're open for them to send you these opportunities, but know that you might pass because it doesn't feel authentically right for you and what you're looking to do. And they will absolutely respect your personal boundaries with that. I have so many actor friends that have had this conversation with reps or have had this conversation with themselves and casting. And we try to be cognizant of it too, of not bringing in kind of the same people for the same kinds of roles and figuring out, you know, what's our way in if we have this kind of recurring role that maybe we would think would mostly be this kind of person. Can we make it something else and try other people for it? Like what other versions of this can there be? Cause we want to try to prevent putting people in that situation all the time too. Um, but yeah, I have, I have so many friends that are like, I am Iranian and I will not play a terrorist, yep. period, end of story. And yep. have built amazing, beautiful careers without ever doing that. And I have friends that just say, take me where the work goes and I'm happy to play interesting, controversial characters. And I know that this isn't my identity, this is my job and we'll do that. And, you know, everyone has their own comfort level with these things and it's, it's just something you have to navigate personally, um, but you have all the power to do that. Truly, it's all on you. And I guess it's more a thing of like, you know, no one person or, or group has control over the kind of stories that are being told per se. But I guess it's having more of those, you know, different groups of ethnicities or people in the writing room. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the voice doesn't like... I get people when they complain about reboots and then they put different ethnicities or genders and roles that were different ones back in the day. And that's, yeah. in my opinion, that's just lazy filmmaking because you're not actually telling a new story. Writing for that community. Like, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I could only write certain things because of the prism of life that I've had versus yeah. someone else who's grown up in, in the Bronx. Like, I couldn't really write authentically about that because I've never lived there. Yeah. And I think it's more about giving the writers more of a voice because that's really where you're going to get original fresh characters. And then where I guess you won't have to see, you know, people playing s stereotypical roles that we've seen them playing for decades now. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's happening so much more that we're people are really responding so well to these diverse stories from different points of view, like, so with, with that as a kind of spinoff, you know, obviously, I, I think maybe with the question that was sent in there from Jonah is around like, well, what, what can you do then if you decide that, okay, I don't want to go up for some of those things, totally get that personal choice. Yeah. But then there's not that many opportunities coming up for roles that are not of that ilk that I'm being considered for. And you're kind of waiting for society or the industry to play catch up. Yeah. What, what could they do to kind of shift perception would it be maybe make just make your own work and show yourself in that light i guess sure i think there's always room to make your own work and 
pave your own path. And if you're not finding the roles that really make you excited and tell your story authentically, then absolutely find a way to write your own story to tell that authentically. I think that's amazing. And then on just a smaller scale, like going out for all of those little parts that it doesn't have to be associated with one kind of person or another. And just taking comfort in that sometimes you can be part of a scene to be a participant in a joke or to be someone doing an action and finding comfort in the fact that everyone is, it's an equal playing field in, in roles like that where it doesn't necessarily require a strong point of view or a story or a history to somebody that there's a gazillion roles to fill in these little fabric of the world pieces that are very equalizing, I think. So on a bigger scale, absolutely create your own work, tell your own story and celebrate that. I think this is the perfect moment for that. And then on a small scale, take joy in those little moments where you don't have to worry about the politics. Because yeah. <laughs> I think that that's yeah. also could be a fun, relieving thing to find that you can go to a set and it's not about that for a minute and you just get to be the person reorganizing the books and having a conversation and, you know, whatever the action is. So awesome. Awesome. That answers the question. Um, not really following on from that, but it's one that gets asked so many times and okay. <laughs> I want to get your, your view on it. Um, okay. So a Andrea Christina has asked, she has a British accent. She's saying, if you have a British accent, but let's say any accent that's different to the character. Yeah. Kind of like what Wallace was saying, I think with the slating in some ways, right? Like, should you enter with the accent of the character or should you be yourself and switch? Hey, this is a great question. I think it depends on the actor's ability and comfort level. Like I have friends who, if they are going in for an American role, they have to stay in an American accent until they're done with the scene and then they can break. It's hard for them to switch in and out. They have to kind of like get into the rhythmic pattern of speaking in an American accent and then continue it. Um, which I think, I, you know, I support whatever feels the most right for someone. Um, some people, it's not that hard for them to dip in and out of accents and can come in as themselves and then can switch pretty seamlessly. So I think that's a huge element is first, what, ha what helps your process? That should always be first of don't worry about me and how I feel. Like what's going to help you do the best work that you can and use that as your North Star of the way that you plan your process. Um, but I do think like if when everything is said and done, you finish the audition, we're going to slate. I think doing your slate, again, this is just me personally, um, in your natural accent and letting that all go is totally fine. I think it's by that point in the process, like we've, you've done your audition, you've got it out of your system. And it's helpful for me to, to know, like, what is your natural state of being for whether that I apply it to other roles or whatever it is. Sometimes it's a great moment to be like, oh, I didn't even know you had an accent. Where are you from? have a conversation and then also for me to subtly check your visa and green card status. Um, Cause I need to then make sure that I can hire you, um, yep. which has been so we've had surprises so many times. So um, just being clear and upfront, I think is really helpful um, and can be beneficial for developing relationships and for getting other parts. And also just to make sure that you can physically get the job you're coming in for. I think it's helpful. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, it, it makes sense. But I think a lot of times we'll go in thinking, you know, I'm here for this one role. So I'm here to, you know, potentially try and book this role. Yeah. And obviously, it's not about that, because the chances of booking any one role is like so many permutations that are out of your control that totally. you're there to just do your work and then forget about it. Easier said than done. Um, <laughs> and, and then but know that you guys are always going to be casting something. Yeah, um, and we want to know who you are. I and that's that's the thing, yeah. Like that's that's I think where we have that thing. I think that the questions when these come in are from the mindset of, you know, okay, you know that I sound American, but if the character is say Spanish, and I'm coming in for that, I need to make sure I come in and sound like a, a, a Hispanic because I don't want you to think that you know I'm not that because right. I'm ruining my chances. And I think we're coming in thinking of how you're going to perceive it or the director or producer if they're in the room versus what you said, which I really like, which is do whatever works for your process. Anything else doesn't matter. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's in the end, it's always best actor for the job. If you come in and you are very right for something and it's not your natural accent, but you can really slay, 
with that, whatever accent you're doing and it's right for the character, it's going to be best actor for the job. It doesn't necessarily, it's not dictated where you're born. And, you know, if, if it's a community that you can represent authentically because it's, you know, of all the different elements and you can be true to it and you're the best actor for the job, you are going to get the job. I think that's the other thing that I really wish actors understood. It's like, it's, it's about you do it. It's whoever is going to be the most right for it. And it's never about someone being not good enough or not. It's just what, what feels the most right based on this whole puzzle that we're building and who's the best actor that's going to give us what we need. And that person could come from anywhere and be anything. And it just, when it clicks, it clicks and you feel it. It's a vibe, right? It's that whole thing. Everybody always talks about the essence, not just, I guess, with a person, but then you guys have that unenviable challenge of how do you then piece all of those things together to make a tapestry that doesn't sort of look jarring on the screen for the audience. Yeah. Yes. It's, it kind of takes, I think a lot of pressure off of the actor when you realize that so much of getting a job is these gut connections and reactions and impulses that it's, it's not about being perfect. It's not about having every word word perfect. It's not about being flawless. It's not being bulletproof where I don't need to give you direction because it's so perfect. Like we, we want you to be flawed and human and messy and find your way through things because that's what we, when we watch film and TV, we watch it because it's a reflection of being alive. And sometimes I, I often watch people's relationships in film and TV and I'm like, Oh, that's what being in an intimate relationship is like, or that's what having a fight is like. And like, you want to watch people be messy and real to learn what other people's experience of humanity is. So how could you come in and be perfect if that's what we're looking for? We're looking for humans. So yeah. really taking that pressure off of yourself and knowing that it's going to come down to a gut response and a connection and something feeling esoterically correct is something that you don't have to worry about being in control of. It's only you being in control of your artistry and your preparation and coming in to collaborate and being as open as you can. And then you just have to keep trusting and trust in your relationships. That's the word, isn't it? Like collaborate, because that's the whole thing. Like no one's doing this in a silo. And even when you're on set, if you're not open to being directed or shifting and you take it as though like, you know, direction means you've done something wrong, then you're fucked. Yes. Um, and so much of the time direction is just to keep, pushing you further and elevate this thing that you're finding. It's, it's triggering you to go even further. So it's, you give us a place to play from and then we can direct you. But if you don't, then what's the point? And yeah, I mean, so much of this really is, I think my personal opinion over time has been that, you know, training and acting training and technique is so important at honing those skills. But ultimately, like anything in life, it's 50, 60, 70, 80% mindset game right? Like anything. And you could have someone who's maybe not as technically good as an actor, but their mindset's there. And, and there's going to be an ease to their vibe versus someone who may be technically incredible, but they're just in their head or, yeah. 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 And it's, yeah, it's a whole business based on relationships and trust and reputation and, and, you know, our reputation is when we get hired for a job, it's directors looking at our bodies of work and sure. who are the kind of actors that we have relationships with? Who do we cast all the time? Who, who do we respond to? And is our taste in line with your taste? And that makes you want to collaborate with us. And so, so much of our work is reflected in you that it's like, I just, I just really feel like that's a piece that's missing from actors that we are looking for the same relationship and fulfillment as you guys are that it's, we're all only as good as the people that we know and can support. And if I've watched an actor grow over the years and we're working on a project and Rory and I will be like, Oh, we should totally have them meet this person. They're going to love each other. And we have this relationship with this actor and we've watched them learn and grow. And we've now got this relationship with this team and you put them together. Like there's no greater feeling than giving that gift to these people. So yeah, it's, I don't know. I can just keep saying it over and over that we need you guys <laughs> to do our jobs. Well, it is that, it is, but it's, it's a mutual <laughs> yeah. thing, right? Like 
you know, I think you learn that. I learned that super candidly from making my own stuff where it's not one person that makes the whole thing. Like you need the editor, you need the casting person, you need the actors, you need the director, the cinematographer, the grip, like all of them to bring their A game as best as they can. Absolutely. One of it, one of it falls out, the project dips a little and then someone else falls out, it dips a little bit more. And so, yeah. you know, whilst actors and directors get maybe more acclaim and more, you know, award nods and stuff. It's it's the whole it's the whole thing from start to finish. Um, yeah, the machine. It is. That's like a super unplanned segue, but I can now segue into the fact that you know um, you did have that you and your team getting that that uh, nomination for the Arios Award for the post. Yeah. I did. I did want to talk about that, and I think just because it you know because it's a Spielberg project. I think a lot of people will be interested to hear about what experience, if any, you might have had with that. What was that process like for you, just as a as a human? Forget as a casting person. Oh wow! What yeah. What was your What was your mindset like going into that, knowing that you're going to be on that project? It was crazy cool. It was amazing. Um, Ellen Lewis, who's like a legendary casting director, was working started out doing all the casting with her and her associate Kate France and they're just brilliant and wonderful and we love them and they reached out to us and they were like hey would you guys be able to come on and help us cast the post we have to go pivot and work on the Irishman we we're like cool 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 of course um so we came on after they had laid the groundwork with some really amazing people and finished rounding up the cast with them um and it was a really crazy experience because the whole process was kind of rushed he we really only cast it shot it and completed it within like a i want to say like three month period like it really happened quickly i think he found this blacklist script and by he i mean steven found this blacklist script and was like it was the the feeling that we all had of like what is what is our point right now going into work every day working on these things when like our political system is crumbling in front of us um and I think he found this script and it gave him a lot of purpose and he was like I want to tell this story that's so applicable to today and it really like we had such access on that project because no one no one could say no it was a Spielberg project and with the subject matter and the time and everyone's frustrations with Trump I think everyone wanted to be a part of it in a small way or a big way and actors would come in and almost all of them would thank us. They'd be like, this felt so good preparing this material. It felt so cathartic, like coming in here and feeling like I was working on something that had a purpose. And it's, it totally changed the way that I came to work and did that job and yeah, saw things for a while. Um, it was really, really gratifying and fulfilling to work on that film. That's and a- it was really cool too. I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say that's awesome. And it is a crazy turnaround time really fast and he's just such an efficient filmmaker that it just went really smoothly and it was a huge cast and like we had huge huge scenes that we shot and then cut that like we had a whole sequence that was a ball that took place at the plaza hotel that the whole sequence got cut and like just we were just it was wild we were casting all kinds of people you um, must have been getting it, the script and going through it and seeing like the scenes and breaking it down and going like, holy shit, that's all. Ow- oh my God, that's awesome. Those, yeah. Like, yeah, it yeah. was awesome and also daunting to be like, oh, we have how many people to cast? Like, I think we cast like 130 people in that film. Like it was huge. The cast was massive. Um, but it was really fulfilling for me because I got to do a lot of the legwork on my own, which was really fun. And I hadn't really had that opportunity to, get to have my hands in the pot like that just because it was such a big project and there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen I got to be really involved in it um which was really really gratifying for me so yeah it was one of the definitely one of my most favorite things I've ever worked on for sure awesome and you know I guess it sounds really cliche and it shouldn't be this way but it is like when you can then drop the fact that like you know I work for the Spielberg project oh yeah that- it feels- for real like we got to go to set when they were um it it was really cool I'm not sure whatever happened with this photo or the initiative but um Amy Pascal 
who was one of the producers on it, um, sent an email out that said, while we're shooting at the Plaza Hotel, we want to take a photo of every woman who's working on this project to celebrate women in film. And I was like, whoa, wow. that's amazing. So um, we used it as our way to take a set visit and we got to watch Meryl Streep work and watch Steven work. And, and then every single woman involved that was there that day on set, I think a lot of people came that weren't needing to be on set that day too. Um, anyone from grips and ADs and the actors and casting, um, they put us all in a room and in the big banquet hall and took a photo. And it was like, it's something I'll always remember. I still have it. And it just felt so special to look around and be like, wow, there's so many women working on this project, A, and B, like just to be in this space where like Meryl Streep is standing two feet away from me and like Amy Pascal is celebrating everyone's work. And it just felt like so celebratory and buzzy to be working on the project generally, but very surreal to be, um, it still doesn't feel real that I got to work on a project that Steven Spielberg was directing for sure. <laughs> just so what an experience, you know, and what a moment to kind of have there with, with all those women to have that sort of ingrained in, in, in digital format. And you can kind of see that photo and not have to pinch yourself because it's like, no, that that's real. Um, yeah. And I have like a little card in my bedroom that, that um, Steven and his producing partner, Christy sent us each a bouquet of flowers. And we got, the nomination for the casting award and I totally framed it I was like I'm sure their assistant sent this and it's not actually from them but it's the sentiment and it says it and this is an experience that I will remember forever and ever and I'm gonna look at this every day and I do awesome that's yeah awesome. it's way way cool all right Carly we could we we could go on and, and we on could talk and for on the rest of the day, talk for the rest of the day. well so do you, so so do you but I do I do like to round this off with um, the the questions that James Lipton would ask on Inside the Actor's Studio. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to dive into that, and and we'll just kind of rattle out those and see what your answers are, which is always okay. fun. Always oh, fun. So the first question is, what is your favorite word? Ephemeral. What is your least favorite word? Mm. No, because I'm not one of those people that hates the word moist. So I don't really have a word that specifically bothers me. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll go with um, lazy. Okay. Too general. Yeah, that's okay. I'll go. With, it's like, I don't think you were feeling that one anyway. Yeah. Uh, next is what turns you on in a creative, intellectual, spiritual kind of way? Ooh. Um... I think nerding out about anything in great detail. I could kiki about truly like I could talk forever as long as me and the person that I'm talking to know a lot about what we're talking about. I think there's something beautiful about celebrating knowledge and debate and having discourse forever. Yeah. That thing really that... An, an insight or an answer that we're specifically looking for, which that... is this entire creative collaboration really yeah in an era where debate and discourse is kind of slowly and slowly and slowly becoming more and more pc and not allowed and you get shut yeah. down for saying one thing that someone else doesn't agree with but um exactly. the most fulfilling friendships in my life are the friends that i have that we can sit for hours and talk about truly anything and feel free to have those conversations. Yeah, it's judgment that kind of, I think, is where we kind of shut down on these kind of things. But that's just people's egos getting in their way, I think. Throw the judgment out with with everything. And, you know, we can have different points of view. Otherwise, it'd be a really boring society and the art would suck too. Yeah, I just love smart people. I want to be around smart people. I want to learn from smart people. I want to be considered a smart person. Knowledge is really is really power for me. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> what um what turns you off then in the same capacity in terms of spiritually or creatively? What's the big turnoff? Um, definitely being single minded or um, yeah, not having the ability to think empathetically outside of your box of knowledge or experience. I don't think there's anything I find more triggering and frustrating than someone with a singular point of view that 
can't be moved or has assumptions about people that can't be changed. Like I just, I just feel fiery anger and then I shrivel up and I panic and I run away. I just can't do it. I can't, I can't listen to Trump speak. I can't look at him. It's too triggering. See, I was going to mention the White House, but I didn't want to do a leading question, but you just said that already, like just openly. I was like, like, genuinely triggering for my mental health. I just can't do, I can read recaps and it makes me a little less angry, but I just can't watch the Fritz. Yeah, I think shutting down the news is the best thing that I've done in my life from a long time ago. It's just a 24-7 news cycle isn't tailored, I think, for anything other than entertainment anyway, in some ways. Like, it's so much filler. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. And so many ex- experts they bring in. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't know. My favorite thing that encompasses and encapsulates that whole thing is um, a Dave Chappelle sketch. I don't know which of his stand-ups it is. But when he talks about, he talks about just after 9-11, they were interviewing people and it was like two days after and they were on one of these, I think it was Fox or something and the anchor turns and says, okay, well now we're going to go to Ja Rule and get Ja Rule's opinion on what's happening now with 9-11. And Chappelle's like, Ja Rule, I don't care about Ja Rule's opinion on 9-11. Like Ja Rule probably doesn't have answers to the kind of questions I have right now. That's so funny and you're like being the genius he is he takes something so serious that's actually happened puts it through the comedy prism but then makes a really like poignant point and i've always remembered that because it's just so genius but then you look and you go they do it all the time like yeah you just have to limit you have to be in control of your access a little bit and just do you take care of yourself in these weird times? Yeah, parental lock your own phone and your own TV, I guess, or something. Yeah, literally. Okay, fifth question is optional only because some people don't like swearing, but uh, oh, the question no, is. I totally swear. Fair I've been enough. trying to do this the whole time. I'm like trying to be good. Oh, I don't care. No, like I swear all the time. So, you know, <laughs> feel free. It's, it's what is your favorite swear word? Ooh, I mean, I'm just, I'm a good old fuck girl. I think it just adds that extra emphasis that you need in so many scenarios. 90%, 90% of people, I don't think you're in bad company. Like, it's, No, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a visceral word to throw in for good or for bad. It's and it interchangeable. Just, it can mean, you know, whatever you want it, it to. It's so much emotion. It's perfect. It's the perfect word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite sound or noise? Ooh. Um, was that it? Was I, that the sound or noise? No, that's uh, just an exciting question because I've been surrounded by such not good noise that I'm like, oh, what's a noise that makes me happy? I love the sound of my essential oil diffuser bubbling. I think it's the most soothing sound on the whole planet. And then it also smells good. And then it just lulls me into a happy place. Um, I think water. Water is really the most soothing, my favorite sound. Any like very silent nature with like a little bit of water lapping kill me i could listen to them forever tranquil are you are you a water sign um i'm a libra oh and i don't know anything about astrology but i think growing up in la there was something really soothing i grew up by the beach so just being in quiet places with water has always been my happy place what's i mean you kind of alluded to this what's your least favorite sound or noise i kind (sighs) of know where this is gonna go (laughs) I think. Well, actually, weirdly, I'm going to pivot and say I can. I'm one of those people that cannot deal with the sound of people chewing, or like repetitive body noises, like repetitive sneezing, where I can predict that you're about to sneeze, or like when I know you're about to cough, when you've like set a pattern, I can't take it. Snoring, can't take it. Yeah, I'm a lot of um, yeah, the chewing and snoring is not for me. Okay, so people basically have to like not eat too much. And try not don't, to sleep around you. Don't, sleep, don't cough, don't sneeze, or I'll never hire you for a job. No, I'm just kidding. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh. there's going to be actors somewhere out there freaking the fuck out. Like, oh my God. <laughs> you must know what I mean, though. When you're like in a quiet place and someone coughs, and then you wait like three seconds, and then they cough again, and then you're like, you're about to cough. And like, it makes me feel like I'm in the Truman Show when I get stuck in like other people's rhythms where I'm like, I shouldn't know this about you. And then it makes me go crazy. <laughs> yeah if it's like if it's like in a movie theater or something but i think for me that's a yeah. different crazy that's because i know you're gonna cough again 
I don't care that you're coughing. I care that you're interrupting my experience that I've paid 15 bucks for, yes. um, which is super selfish. Uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, the chewing thing I get too, people have said that before, but I think where they were coming from was more like, you know, when people chew, but like they don't chew with their mouth closed and it's super loud. Yeah. Most people, I mean, yeah. The like yeah. loud smacking chewing. Yeah. Your gum. face, your <laughs> face changed as soon as I said that it was, it was, if daggers could come out of your eyes. Yeah. Very good. It's um, been right. What job or profession other than what you do or already have done would you most want to attempt? Oh my God. Being an interior decorator. Okay. That okay. I always use interior design as a metaphor for casting. I think it's the perfect metaphor for what casting is that like we get a client and they're like, I have this living room that I want to make feel like, like a sixties modern vibe, but with like a, a space age twist. And you're like, cool. I see the ingredients to what you're looking for. And sometimes we're like, here's a statement couch that we think could anchor your room. A la, here's the star that we think could like anchor yeah. your project. And then we're like, okay, and then you compare it with like this rug or this rug or like this thing and this thing. And like we do a lot of like playing around with combinations until it becomes like a room that they could never have pictured themselves. Um, but I'm a huge interior design nerd and I spend a lot of, uh, I, my happy place is watching home decorating shows. Okay. Well, which there are many these days. They've kind of come out of nowhere. Do you oh, watch, um, do you so watch, do you watch the home decorating shows only or do you also watch like, um, all those shows where they go and like remodel and like you know break down someone's home and remake something. That's my favorite thing. Okay. I find when I am stressed or anxious or sad, I love home flipping shows because they start with like a really messy problem, and then they have a budget and they have constraints, and then they figure out how to make it clean and functional and nice, and then more beautiful than where it started, and then everyone is happy. And it always buttons up so nicely. And it's, oh my God, it's the most cathartic thing. I find so much peace and joy. There's in that one. Is it like, is it a celebrity <laughs> one that's happening now? There was one in the last few weeks where it came out of the news where Brad Pitt did that thing for his makeup artist. Did you see that? Oh, I saw that, but I, I didn't watch it. I don't really okay. know. Okay. I don't know I much about that. it either. I just saw the article where like he did something for his makeup artist and he like, I saw the same thing. yeah, went in and did some renovation or something. And uh, dream. yeah. It's it's an interesting metaphor. It does make sense when I think about it, though. The casting being kind of like that. Yeah, you, you source little pieces. And yeah, it's like you know, and then for an actor, it's a weird way, but it's almost like, okay, am I the couch in this scene, or am I like you know the lamp? And the lamp is important, exactly. but the lamp is only there to light the couch at nighttime. So it's like, where do you fit in the story? Is kind of well, that's almost exactly what we were talking about with the self tape thing is knowing where that character fits in the scope of the scene like where is it time to overindulge in a moment and where is it time to give something to punchline and cut to black and end your tape and under and show that you understand the parameters of the scene and what your purpose of being involved in the scene is like there's so much you can do in a tape to show that you understand your your side of things that helps me then integrate you into the thing that we're building I guess that's the scene, but also if you can, the story too, right? Because obviously like, it's great to know where I fit in the scene, but then is that scene act one or is that like, you know, the midpoint or is that act three? Because that's also going to inform, you know, if I'm a co-star or guest star reading for this against say one of the leads, yeah. what is what I'm doing, doing to trigger their story arc? Because that's really why you're there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then in the end, you and I are, I'm, putting the pieces together in the home you are posing as a piece in the home and then in the end we're giving the director a home and they get to live in it and love it and it's theirs and they get to like tweak things as they see fit as they sit around and look at it and then we've created this beautiful gift that like I get to hand off and you get to be a part of and then the director gets to live in and it's this kind of cool I like the analogy. You should write like a coffee table book, which is like the analogy <laughs> around that. And like, just put it out there, get it on Amazon, you know, and then it'd be like in all the casting offices, casting is an interior design analogy. It works. Yeah. It? I think it kind of does. Weirdly. does. I'm going to use it now. I'll, I'll give you credit, but I'm going to okay. swipe it. I think I actually originally got it from Jordan Thaler. I think he was the first person I heard mention that. Just, just as keep a it for yourself. A brilliant casting director. That's just, just keep it for yourself. Just claim it. 
Um, no, no, he did not know how that would impact me. And <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what job profession would you, under no circumstances, ever want to do? Oh my God, there's just so many. Okay, well, the I mean, one, the one you really wouldn't. <laughs> um, I think this is maybe not the best answer in this current moment, but being in the medical profession, I don't know if I could do it. I think I admire everyone who is doing this on the front lines so much. I cannot look at blood. I have, I am not, I have no good stomach around medical things. I think I would pass out. Um, I'm just in awe of the people that can put their heads down and focus and that it doesn't affect them and they can support other people. I think I would just fully panic. I, I can't even watch medical shows. I'm, I've never watched Grey's Anatomy. I've never watched those procedurals. Like I find it, it makes my skin crawl. No needles, no injuries. I couldn't look at someone's broken bone without panicking. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. It is, um, it's a specific discipline, isn't it? I think as well when you, when yeah. you see how they have to disconnect emotion or at least give the veneer of disconnecting emotionally because, you know, yeah. the amount of patients that they see, like, I and don't know how you do connect So empathetically with all their patients. Like I could never, it's amazing to me that balance. Absolutely. Um, final question. I kind of put my own spin on it, but it's the same right. ethos, which is when it's all said and done, what would you like the story of your life to be? Ooh. Um, I hope the story of my life reflects a strong, independent woman who's uh, not afraid of going for what they want and helping to change things in other people's lives for the better. I think that's, I want people to remember me as someone like that. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. That's, yeah. that's the last of the, of the 10. Although I do now kind of throw in a, a one that's nothing to do with that, which is just generally like, what, what are you watching right now? If anything, are you watching anything good? Any, uh, any shows, any movies you've seen that you're like, I just want tips to be fair. That's all I ask it for. Okay, great. Well, um, I have watched about 15 seasons of Survivor. So if you have any interest in diving into Survivor, I will tell you where to begin and give you a full watch list. It, I feel like as someone in the business, it's so informative about human nature. And just, I just think it's amazing. It's, it's really a cool social experiment. Um, and I've been watching Normal People. Yeah, I just finished it last night. Oh my god! I I've got the, um, the the casting person from that's coming on in a few weeks. I'm really excited to talk to her because tell her she did an incredible job. The cast is spot on, perfect, and exactly how I read it in the book. And are you so binging fun. it? Like, how are you? How are you taking in the cut? Yeah, you're just binging it. Majorly, I started it and I was like, oh, I'll just watch a couple. When I read the book, I read it in like a day and a half I just like didn't put it down and I was like I am nervous to get that involved in this world again it's it um, I I didn't read the book I didn't know much about it to be fair so interestingly then like from your reading and interpretation of the book how is it translated to those characters is it what you kind of envisaged so spot on. yeah I thought they did a perfect job it's I think it's so hard to try to recreate a book and do something but I think they they stayed really true to it I'm not done yet but thus far they've stayed so true to the book and the structure of the book and I didn't know how they were going to be able to do it because so much of it is about the shifting perspectives and them talking about just the way they feel but all of those tight shots without there's really so many moments where they don't talk and you learn so much and that's what the book does it's all about like the, the physical feelings and things that are happening between them that then tells the story. So I thought they just did a perfect job of it. It's and the cast is perfect. I yeah, love it. it's it's great. Which which episode are you on? I'm on episode six. So I'm six? like halfway through. Yeah, I did the same thing. I was like, I'll watch two episodes. I'm like, oh, I'll just watch half of it and then watch the That's second half. Literally, what I did. I was like, I'm just gonna dip my toe in and see if I'm prepared to go back into this world that like totally consumed me. I also read the book in Sligo I was in Ireland so I was what? in the town where it took place when I happened to be reading the book and it was like too much for my brain I was like too deep in I thought they were all real people by the end of it and I was like I'm you're looking you were looking for them and it was how was that like that's a, either a major coincidence or 
How come? It was pretty coincidental. I had asked for, I go to Ireland every year for a film festival where I met Manuel at actually. Um, and I put out the call on Facebook, I think, to see what people were reading and what I should read in my, we always take like a little road trip before we go to the festival, Rory and I. And so I was like, we're getting ready for our yearly road trip around Ireland. What should I read? And so many people were like, read normal people. So I got it. And I was like, oh, I think it takes place in Ireland. Like, that's cool. But I didn't really know that it took place in the same county that we happened to be doing our road trip in. And it was just perfect timing. Wow. And yeah, it was great fun to read that there. Awesome. Well, I, I think, um, you know, your next few days is probably going to be finishing off the show. I'm I think gonna... I hang up with you and pretend like I'm going to go on a walk and really just watch normal people. You could still do a walk. Yeah, no, you're not going to actually do a walk halfway through. Once you start, you're just going to finish it. Yeah, maybe I'll just rip the Band-Aid off and take the walk now and then come back. Exactly. The that's, <laughs> the best, that's the best way to do it. Awesome. Cool. Well, listen, Carly, it's been so much fun chatting with you, I guess. <laughs> so great. Any... So great. Um, any like closing remarks, anything that you want to leave people with that are going to watch or listen to this that you think is super important for them to just take and, and carry with them? Um, well, I'm sorry that I've rambled so much. Um, hopefully it's coherent. And um, I hope this shows, again, how human we all are in this process, that no one holds all the cards and no one has all of the power. And we really look to each other to pass the baton of power constantly. That... I want you to know more and do better than I could ever help you with. And sometimes you want to come in and have me be that guiding light. And it just goes back and forth. And um, yeah, I really hope that we all cherish our symbiotic relationships and moving into the next phase of the business, do it with kindness and support because the future is unknown for all of us. So let's do it kindly together. <laughs>